It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor, coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 27. The message today is dealing with weathering a storm, and this would be part two, weathering a storm. And our story today will pick up in Acts 27, and God willing, it'll complete in the first few verses of Acts 28. Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem. He wasn't going to get a fair trial, he knew, from the religious leaders there, as Stephen did not get a fair trial and Jesus did not get a fair trial. So being a Roman citizen, he appealed to Caesar. You know, sometimes they'll move a court case from one town to another if they say, you're not going to get a fair trial in this town because of um, some of the sentiments that may already be swirling around connected with the event. And so because there was already such a tremendous bias against Christianity in Jerusalem, he appealed to Caesar. Well, the quickest way to do that was by ship. But they'd waited a little late in the season to begin this journey. Paul is committed to the, uh, the care of a Roman centurion named Julius who proves to be a very wise and seems to be a just man. Uh, you look at the centurions in the Bible and virtually all of them uh, turn out to be pretty good men. Uh, they say on a Roman battlefield that some of the common soldiers might frighten and flee if it wasn't for the high caliber of the centurions in the Roman army. They were, uh, you had to be pretty strong, smart, and fearless to become a centurion. And so they already had that uh, nobility about them. As they're making their journey by ship, the winds are against them. Uh, the several times they have to skirt around the back of various islands in the Mediterranean to try and make any progress. And then at one point, when they're about to leave Crete, they've docked at a place called Fair Havens. Paul, who's just a prisoner, he's one of many prisoners on this boat, he said, you know, I know something about sailing. Someone estimated that Paul maybe had sailed thousands of miles in his life, being from Tarsus and going back and forth to Jerusalem for the feasts and all of his journey. Three times shipwrecked, he survived. Uh, he knew something about it. And uh, he said, I perceive that this journey is going to end with a disaster, not only of the ship and the cargo, but of the lives, the souls. And I advise you, it's past the season for safe sailing. You ought to stay right where you're at. But Fair Havens was a little podunk. I mean, they called it Fair Havens, but that's like when you're driving across Nevada and you see a little hotel that says Paradise. <laughs> it was a misnomer. And so they said, we don't want to stay here. Let's make it to Phoenix. Well, in their attempt to make it to Phoenix, the wind first looked good, but then it turned bad. And it started driving them out into sea, and it got worse and worse. And the next thing you knew, they found themselves in the middle of a full-blown winter hurricane in the Mediterranean in a primitive boat. Now, just um, the boats weren't that primitive. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk to you about uh, some of the maritime technology that they had back in Paul's day. But one thing I'll mention, if you read in Acts 27, verse 37, it says, and in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. You know, some people said you can't trust the Bible because they make these outrageous statements. And back in the time of the apostles, the boats were very small. They were like these little Egyptian river boats. And, and you think about the days of Christopher Columbus. Any of you remember your American history? What is it? The Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria. And each of those boats held maybe 30 people. And that was, you know, the age of exploration. So here there's this one Alexandrian wheat ship and it says there's not only all the cargo but 276 people. And so some of the critics used to mock the Bible and say it can't be trusted. Well, they began to do some excavation to build Rome's 
International Airport called the Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Italy by the mouth of the Tiber River outside of Rome. And in excavating for the airport, they needed this big flat, they found a place that had once been a port. And digging around, they uncovered a ship in the mud, had been fairly well preserved, at least the bottom half of it. It's now known as Caligula's giant ship. The Emperor Caligula, and the ship dates from 35 A.D. Paul's journey is 59 A.D. later. In 35 A.D., Caligula had built, built himself a floating palace. It was 7,400 tons. Is, you know, the tonnage is how you rate a ship. 341 feet long, 66 feet wide, had six decks, and carried a crew of seven to eight hundred, mostly servants. Had a theater on board and a, the buffet and all these amenities, and it was Caligula was a very decadent emperor. And it was like a floating orgy on this ship. But they've discovered that now. Had a jacuzzi on the ship and a way to heat the water. They had a fire, a boiler going underneath it. It's this fantastic technology that they found. So it shouldn't strain you at all to think that there was a wheat ship that also could hold 276 soldiers back in Paul's day. So in the midst of the storm, they are captured in a time of great darkness. They don't know where they are. You can read in verse 20, uh, verse 20 Acts 27, verse 20, now when neither sun nor star appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, that's Luke's diminutive way of saying we are getting beaten to death by a very big tempest, all hope that we should be saved was finally given up. You know, Paul tells us that there are some great things, faith and love, and I didn't do them in order because the last one is what I wanted you to remember, hope. Hope. Hope springs eternal. You ever lose hope that you'll be saved? Sometimes people come to church for years and they lose hope that they can be saved and they just go through the motions. I figure my judgment won't be severe if I at least do my best. Probably won't be saved. Punishment won't be as bad. So they're going through the motions hopeless. And when you look at the world today, you can see where people might begin to lose hope. Things seem to be spiraling out of control. Maybe in your life you're experiencing some form of storm. How do you make it through when you don't know where you are? You know, they say that in order to have any security, you need to have the answer to three very important questions. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? And in maritime adventures, they used the sun and they used the stars to fix a position to see what their progress was about where they've come from, where they were, and where they were going. They can't see anything. They don't know where they are. If it wasn't for their equilibrium, which was already seasick, they wouldn't know what end was up or down. And uh, they did not have the kind of automatically inflatable lifeboats that they have on some of the ships today. A little skiff in the back that wasn't very seaworthy by itself. Matter of fact, they took the skiff and put it on the ship when the storm began. So they're having a rough time. This is a severe storm. And you can read here, they've already jettisoned the cargo. Um, you go to verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now, it wasn't just that Paul was a prophet. He was just using common sense when he said it's past sailing season. You know, God's providence often follows our prudence. Uh, God is, I think, a lot more liberal with his miracles when we use good judgment. And uh, they hadn't even used good judgment. So he begins by saying, my Jewish grandmother used to do this all the time, I told you so. And, you know, just to heap on the guilt a little bit. And he's also saying, maybe you should have listened to me then 
maybe you should listen to me now. And before this trip is over, it is astonishing how Paul goes from a position of being a slave, being transported like a rat on this boat, to really being captain of the whole operation. God has a way of taking his servants and putting them in positions where they are able to help guide. And he does this here. Paul is a servant of God. He's on a mission for God. And he said, uh, and now I urge you to take heart. Don't lose hope. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God who I belong, to whom I belong, and who I serve. I don't serve Nero or Caligula or Tiberius. I serve God. And his messenger came to me tonight because I've been praying for you. That's the implication. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Paul is afraid that he's not going to make it to Rome because he wants to preach in Rome. So now he's thinking, I'm going to die in this tub of a boat out here in the middle of the Mediterranean. I'm never going to get there. And that was his concern. And the angel said, don't worry, Paul. You're going to make it to Rome. You're going to preach before Caesar. But Paul was also praying for all the other sailors on the boat. You notice, Paul did not say, Lord, please save this expensive boat. He said, save the people on the boat. Now, the owner of the ship, he was more concerned about his cargo. There might even be an analogy in this story. Think about it for a moment. You've got a ship that's going to bring grain to the Roman capital. And that's a type for the Word of God. The important thing on that ship was Paul and Luke and their friend. They were the ones going to Rome to bring the real bread of life to uh, the capital. Do not be afraid. You will stand before Caesar, and God has granted you all those who sail with you. He had been praying for the people. Therefore, take heart, Paul says, for I believe that God, it will be just as God told me. I believe the word of God will come true. Now, was there anything in the environment about what they could see that would make them think that Paul was right? When Paul, clinging to what's left of the rigging on the ship, shouts to the sailors gathered on the deck, because they're all seasick, you need to stay pretty close to the deck. And they're swaying back and forth, and they're green in their faces, and they all have lost hope that they're going to live. And the wind is howling, and the waves are hitting them in the face. And Paul says, cheer up. We're going to make it. God spoke to me tonight. The ship's not going to make it. That must have worried him a little bit. But be encouraged. You'll live. I don't think at that point any of them cared very much about the ship. He said, take heart, for I believe God. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now you notice in this little passage I just read here, what was the priority for Paul? The ship or the souls? Why did Jesus come into this world? To save stuff or to save souls? The important thing is the people. You know, even in the story of Jonah, they were throwing everything overboard, but they were reluctant to throw Jonah overboard. Why? Because Jesus said, you're worth more than many sheep, let alone cargo. We're made in the image of God. You know, uh, in 1998, Hurricane Mitch was the biggest hurricane of the season. Some of you probably still remember Hurricane Mitch in spite of the, all the other natural disasters we've had since then that would eclipse everything. I remember it was just before we did Net 99 in New York. And there were about 19,325 people died from Hurricane Mitch. A lot more than Katrina. Most of them in Central America, Honduras. And 31 of those people died that probably didn't need to die. They were part of the crew of a ship that was called the Fantôme, which means phantom or ghost in French. 
and it was the pride and joy of a cruise line called Windjammer Barefoot Cruises. Worth about $15 million. Problem was it wasn't insured. They were self-insured, which sometimes means you're not really insured. And when they saw the weather, they were in the middle of a cruise in the uh, Gulf, and they saw the storm was coming. At first they thought we can outrun it to the south, but it began to corner them on the coast of Belize, Matter of fact, this month we will be, the bachelors will be in Belize. And uh, they took off and they had to come back to Belize City and that was the time for them to park the boat and run for their lives. But they said, you know, this is an expensive ship. If there's any chance we can save the ship, we're willing to risk at least some of the crew. And so they put off about 100 passengers yeah, and some of the crew, and they kept the necessary captain and 30 crew members, and they tried to outrun the storm. Well, these sailboats don't go that fast. And so they zigged, and they zagged, and they jogged, and they tacked. They went behind an island that was pretty flat, trying to find some cover. Last time, the owner of the ship, who was calling on their radio, Michael D. Burke, the president of the um, cruise lines, heard from them. They were in 52-foot seas, and 100 mile an hour winds and at that point the sky and the sea just merge into one gray spray and then the radio went out the ship 280 feet long was a steel hulled sailboat you have a picture of it right there on your screen completely disappeared a few weeks of searching after the storm they finally did turn up uh, six life vests and two flattened lifeboats on the shore of Guatemala that were in stenciled phantom. Interesting, it's called the phantom and it just disappeared. Because someone maybe thought the ship was worth more than the souls. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? <laughs> Paul was praying for the souls. And by the way, Paul's a good example for all of us. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So we ought to make souls a priority in what we do. Amen? Amen? So he gave them this message of encouragement from God to sustain them during the storm. And then it tells us in verse 27, when the 14th night had come as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. Now the Adriatic that they refer to there was a very general term. It isn't the Adriatic Sea proper we refer to today. The Adriatic is the term they use for the middle of the Mediterranean, which by the way is where Malta is. They were driven back and forth, up and down in the middle of the Mediterranean. And, uh, it, and by the way, he says the 14th day. You ought to look up the word 14 in your Bible. It appears quite a number of times. The word 14 is compared to Paul's life three times, the number 14. Of course, that's a composite of two sevens. The Bible tells us the genealogies of Jesus and Matthew are divided into two sevens, totaling 14. And so it's just an interesting number, and I'm not sure how much more to say about that. But what is interesting is nautically, when this story has been studied by, studied by um, Maritime historians, they say it makes sense. He had 520 miles to go from Crete. They averaged in a storm 37 miles a day. That would have taken them 14 days to reach Malta, which is exactly what Paul says. This story is full of very interesting historic information that really reinforces the Bible is not only true uh, in the stories that it tells, it's accurate in the details that it gives. Now, they're going through this storm and they're trying to find salvation from the storm. I think it's significant. It says, about midnight, the sailors sensed they were drawing near some land. You notice it's often at the darkest hour that salvation comes. Matthew 25, speaking of when the Savior comes in the parable of the ten virgins, it says, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Acts 16.25, Paul and Silas are locked in jail and they've been beaten and it's as dark as it gets and they're sore and they're uncomfortable. They've been persecuted. 
but they're singing and they're praying. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and God sends an earthquake and he delivers them. You know, in some ways, our world, you wonder how much worse can it get? Uh, deliverance is especially appreciated at the darkest hour. And I heard uh, Brother Anger say during the offering appeal, you know, as we get into a storm and it gets darker, that is not the time to turn down the light in the lighthouse. As we near the end of time, God's church as a lighthouse needs to increase the intensity, the candle power of that light. Amen? Let our light shine. So they realize they're nearing some land. Go back to the story here. And uh, they took soundings. Verse 28. How did they tell they were nearing some land? Well, you know, when you get about a quarter mile in a storm from a rocky shore, you can begin to hear the constant breaking of the waves, which sounds different from when waves break on water. When the waves are breaking on the rock, it makes a different kind of sound. And they begin to hear this constant roar in the distance. The sailors were acquainted with that, and they said, I think we're getting near some land. They can't see it, but they hear something different. Maybe there's some change in the pattern of the waves. You know, it, it, it's very interesting, but um, I can't confirm it, but it is nevertheless very interesting and it may be true. They say the way the ancient Polynesians were able to navigate around the massive Pacific Ocean and somehow find an island was by using a technique of circles that were bent, intersecting circles, that helped them read the pattern of the swells on the ocean because islands break up the swells and create a different pattern and you can study these. We can do it with computers now. You can tell where an island is in a body of water if you know where the waves are coming from by how the wave patterns are feel. We can extrapolate or how the wave patterns appear, you can extrapolate backwards and sort of locate where will that landmass be, how big will it be, based on the pattern of the swells. Well, now they're finding the, in these ancient Polynesian cult cultures, they had these strange concentric circles and said, what did that all mean? They said, well, that was our compass. That's how we found our way around the Pacific. We would read the waves to find the islands. And maybe they could tell there was a change in the pattern of the waves and they were nearing some land but anyway it inspired them to begin to sound. Now in Bible times what that meant is they had a long long rope. They must have kept this when they threw everything else. Had a rock or some kind of lead weight. They did have lead at the bottom of that rope. And there's knots tied you know when you measure off fathoms. Fathoms used to be a knot tied uh, actually, when they measured how many knots a ship was traveling, they would throw out this floating rope, and as quickly as the knots went out, they'd say, that's how many knots were traveling. And so they had another rope with knots on it. They'd drop over to sound, and they'd say, how many fathoms deep we are, based on how many knots before the thing, thing would drop. Very quickly, when it hit the bottom, it would slow down and begin to bu bundle up on top of the water. And I've seen fishermen do bottom fishing that way, where they throw out, they want the bait just to sit on the water, they throw out it and they watch it go down and when it finally hits the bottom it stops pulling down and you can say, all right, that's how deep we are. Well, they took soundings and so they're measuring, you know, as you get closer to an island it starts to get more and more what? Shallow. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And they gone a little farther. They took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. That's all you need. What does that mean? We're nearing land. Now, could they see the land? No. Did they know where they were based on the stars or the sun? No. But they did have some ways of telling when they were near. Do we have some ways to tell that we are getting near the end? Now, there are people out there that have calculated the exact day of Christ's coming. Matter of fact, this is April? Yeah, we're in, we're in April. We're in April now, but I mean, yeah, so we're... Yeah, you, 51 days? Are you counting down? <laughs> yeah, there's somebody who's actually pinpointed. They've got this, um, in my opinion, a convoluted method of pinpointing the date for Christ's coming. And, and the Bible tells us we can't know the day and the hour. It's very clear. But does it tell us we can know when it's near? 
And I think every now and then we need to toss out the rope and take a sounding and find out when we're nearing land. So they took soundings and they see that it's getting more and more shallow. They don't want to hit, what time is it? What time of day is it? It's about midnight. Is that bright or dark? Matter of fact, I was trying to picture to myself how was Paul addressing the crew on the deck of this ship in a hurricane without electric lights back in those days where they could even see them? I mean, can you imagine trying to hold up one of them little lamps like the ten virgins carried? Poof! Keeping one of those things lit? I was wondering, uh, we used to have what we call hurricane lamps. Any of you remember the little red lamps? They're like kerosene lamps, but they had a cage around them that was a little more protected. And to light it, you press the lever, and you put it, it's a kerosene lamp, but it was especially protected. You could take it out to the barn to milk because it was protected against the wind. We had a couple of those up in Covalo. And uh, if they didn't have a hurricane lamp, I'm thinking, how did they have any kind of light? Maybe they didn't even see Paul. I just heard him. But now it's dark. They say it's getting shallow. They thought, we're going to crash on the rocks and drown. We don't know where we're going. We need to do what we can to stop the progress, to, to prevent impending disaster. Then fearing, verse 29, we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. Well, that's probably good advice for us. Yeah, I read about these four anchors and you know what came into my mind is in Revelation chapter 7, just before the end, the world goes through a storm. Isn't that right? And before it hits the rock, so to speak, the angels are the only thing that prevents the ship of God's church from just crashing on the shore. And then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding, like these anchors, the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. Now, they may not have had the naval metal anchors, but they did have anchors of some sort. They threw four of them off the back. And you might say, why off the back? Don't they usually throw the anchors off the bow? Well, that depends on the waves and the wind and how it's going to turn the boat. So evidently they thought the safest thing right now is to have the anchors off the bow because when we cut the anchors, we want the bow to go towards the shore and not the stern. You want to go ahead first. You don't want to go breach towards the shore. So they're anchoring off the back because the waves are pushing them towards the shore. In the same way, I think right now, God's angels are just holding back the winds of strife. I think right now, if the angels of God, these are, of course, figurative, symbolic angels, that they're preventing just total chaos in our world right now. Matter of fact, it's long before now I thought things were going to totally just bust into smithereens. And God has been restraining to save life. Fearing we should run aground. So, back to our story. While they're doing this at night and they're tying off the anchors, it says, verse 30, as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship. Now these are not the soldiers. These are not the prisoners. These are the sailors who just are, they know something about the sea and they think, we're going to crash on the rocks and there's only one lifeboat and there's 276 of us. They didn't say women and children first because there may not have been any women and children. So after you eliminate women and children, then it's every man for himself. And they were thinking, every man for himself. And if we wait till day and we try to lower this boat, everybody's going to sort of be clamoring towards it like rats off a sinking ship. So pretending they're putting an additional anchor off the bow, they're actually making to lower their one little skiff they got this dinghy they're going to drop off in the water and the sailors are hoping that they can somehow surf to shore in this uh, vestige of a lifeboat. They let it down from the ship and they into the sea under pretense, they're being pretentious, of putting out anchors from the prow or the bow. Paul knew what was going on. He had that gift of discernment. He said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Why do he say that? Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. 
I will open that up to suggestion. I got a couple theories. One theory is they thought they might need the crew when the plane goes down. <laughs> you know, a crew is supposed to be trained on how to evacuate the plane. They might have thought they're going to still need the crew to negotiate what's left of that last stretch before they break on the rocks. Might be that. But I think it's even more than that. I think that this whole chapter is in the Bible to tell us about here you've got a boatload of judgment-bound prisoners making their way to the presence of the king. Paul is there interceding for their salvation. I think it's like an analogy. God's, God's often compared his church to like a ship on the sea. Isn't that what happened in the story of Noah? Only those in the ship were saved. And he's basically saying, we as a people need to stay together as we near the shore. Christ said, all men will know you're my disciples by what? By your love for one another. And uh, I thought it was interesting that he told the centurion, unless these men stay in the ship, we cannot be saved. The soldiers hearing that, they cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it drop off. It's the one lifeboat. You know, of the lifeboats on the Titanic, many of them launched away half full. As they got near the end, they waited too long. The ship was listing, and one of the last lifeboats actually kind of flipped over, and some people uh, survived by clinging to the keel of that capsized lifeboat, but they had waited too long. But can you imagine having one lifeboat and the soldiers saying, cut it away? You've heard the story about, was it Cortez, that when he landed his ships, he was afraid the soldiers would get uh, frightened by the uh, the challenges that they were going to encounter that he burned the fleet as it was anchored so he said you got one direction forward way of escape no no way of escape cut it away and so they cut away the ropes and the skiff fell off into the sea as the day was about to dawn Paul implored them all to take food he said you need to eat Today is the 14th day, and you've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Now, there's a couple of reasons that they probably hadn't eaten anything. One reason is what? Probably seasick. But I'll tell you another reason. We just got done reading uh, John Newton's autobiography, and he talks about a couple of storms at sea. And one storm in particular, they had these primitive pumps, these wooden vessels. When they creaked and they groaned, water came in. Even good ships have a bilge pump because water just somehow seems to get in, whether it's condensation. And when there's water washing over the deck, unless it's a perfectly sealed deck, which they did not have back then, water still manages to leak in. It comes in with the crew opens the hatch or something. And in this storm, 276 men, big storm, big ship, water's coming in. A lot of these men, the, the sailors, the soldiers, the, the um, prisoners, they are probably working around the clock. They did not have pumps. They had primitive buckets. They are passing buckets constantly, all day, all night. They're down there. They take turns. They say, I'm too sick. I can't. They go up on deck, and they lose their lunch, and they come back down again. Of course, they didn't have any lunch to lose because they hadn't been eaten. They go back down again. They'd be passing the buckets, and they're throwing the water, trying to keep the thing floating. And it is a desperate, desperate time on a ship like that. And Paul says, you haven't eaten anything 14 days. You ever go on a 14-day fast and try and work at the same time? But what does eating mean for us as Christians? If we're going into the storm, you need to fortify yourself with the Word of God. You notice they'd thrown about everything overboard they could, but they kept some bread. And so Paul said, you need to eat. I urge you, take nourishment for your survival. I've underlined that in my Bible. As you near the shore, friends, I urge you, take nourishment for your survival. It is a matter of life and death. If you want to make it through this storm, then you need to feed your soul, friends. Since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. I should have underlined that one too, but I didn't. <laughs> and when he had said these things, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. 
And then when he bro broke it, he began to eat. You know, he did what Jesus did. He blessed the food. Isn't that, what an opportunity. Here they are in a storm. You can think about this. He said, get some bread. And you know, they're all rocking around. The anchors are holding them. They can hear it groaning and creaking. The waves are crashing on the shore. The wind is howling. And every, he said, oh, they say, okay, yeah, we'll eat something. He said, hang a minute. I need to have prayer. He said, you're not going to eat this bread until I have my prayer. I'm going to bless it. Now, the reason I mention this is I know there are some Christians that when you go out in public and you eat, you look around and you think, well, what will all these pagans think if I bless my food? And uh, you think, well, you know, I'll just I'll say, bow my head and I'll say a few words. And yeah, I've done that too because you don't want to be a spectacle. But um, if I'm ever with anybody, it doesn't matter if you're surrounded by soldiers and prisoners and sailors. You bless your food. Amen. You let them know. You tell them, I'm thanking God for my food, and I'm going to ask his blessing on my food. And there's more to it than that. When you eat the word of God, should you pray first and ask God to bless your meal, to give you wisdom? And when he had broken bread, he began to eat then they were all encouraged. They hadn't eaten anything yet. They're watching Paul eat. They're encouraged. And they were encouraged saying, well, he must think he's going to live. He's not acting like this is his last meal. He's acting like he needs strength for a swim. Now, your grandmother would have said, don't eat if you're going swimming. But Paul is saying, eat before you go swimming. Eat a little something. And they were all encouraged and took food themselves. Would you like to encourage someone else to study the Bible? Let them see you eating. And in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. So when they'd eaten enough, they lightened the ship and they threw out the wheat into the sea. They threw out the remainder, meaning you need to store up what you're going to need for that last stretch. You know, the day is coming where you may not have a Bible in your hand as you near shore. That last couple hundred yards, you better have something stored away. You might be tested for what you believe, and the Holy Spirit promises, I will bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. That's assuming you've read it already. And so you need to be filling your mind with the Word of God now because someday you might be called on the carpet by the kings and leaders of this world to defend your faith, and you might not be able to say, oh, can I have my Bible computer program and I'll do a search? He wants you to have it here. What did Jesus do in the desert with the devil? Did he say, hang on, Satan. Let me get out my iPad. I got a Bible program here. I'll search it. Or did he have it stored away in his mind? We need to have it stored in our heart. Thy word I have hidden on my computer that I might not sin against you. Now, I'm talking to myself now. I've become kind of weak because I'm so used to searching my computer. I've got to remember where it is, not only in the Bible, but stored away in my mind. Now when it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they observed the bay, in the bay a beach, into which they planned to run the ship if possible. It didn't look hopeful. They have no sail left. Rudder's probably broken. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea. They didn't even try and pull them up again. They know they're making the last run. The ship has already fallen apart. Loosing the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail. I said a minute ago they may not have had a sail. They evidently had a mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met. You know, when the ocean goes around an island, sometimes it wraps around and it meets again. And the, uh, I've been to the island of Malta, and it's, you know, out there in the middle of the Mediterranean. They got struck by two seas that began to spin around like a whirlpool. They ran the ship aground. It either hit a rock or sand. The bow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being beaten back and forth by the violence of the waves. Now the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. Why are they going to do that? Roman law was that if you lose, if you're a Roman soldier and you lose a prisoner, whatever sentence that prisoner had coming, you get. Many of these prisoners on this boat 
are not only on their way for judgment, many of them are probably on their way to be poured into the great big old maw of the Colosseum where people were being killed on a daily basis for entertainment. That was in its prime during the time of 59 AD. And a lot of these prisoners around Paul, they are just fodder. Their lives were going to be fodder for the entertainment of the Roman civilization. But Paul is praying for them. He's praying for their souls. So they're going to kill them all. I mean, they're just, you know, they're going to die in the Colosseums, most of them. But if they did it to one, they had to do it to all. And Julius said, Paul has saved our lives. Paul is the one we should have listened to. This man has got the Spirit of God. Well, I'm not going to kill him. Let's take the chance that we're not going to lose any prisoners, that none will escape. The centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. So it was, they all escaped safely to land. What are the odds in a storm like that? A lot of them couldn't swim. Couldn't believe when we were reading the story of John Newton, here's this sailor been sailor for years and he says two or three times during, during the book you know if I'd fallen in I'd be in big trouble because I couldn't swim I thought that was criteria for anybody in the British Navy to be able to swim but not so a lot of them didn't even know how to swim so how they survive clinging to pieces of the ship now when should we leave the church is there ever a time when you ought to leave the church well, maybe. <laughs> this is on tape, so I've got to qualify that. If you are part of a church that no longer allows you to practice and preach the convictions you have, you really have no alternative but to go somewhere else or compromise your convictions. There are things that I see happening in the church I don't agree with. I mean, we all, there's always been uh, the waves of apostasy have always beat against God's church. There's nothing new about that. But you can't bail a boat from the outside. If you're going to bail it, you've got to be in the boat, right? You can't clean a house from the outside. You've got to be in the church to bring revival. So the issue is, as long as you're able to practice your convic convictions and to share the truth, you need to stay in the boat. But is there a day coming when a church that uh, is labeled as illegal because of their convictions that they're going to have to go underground? Is our church in that day going to have offices on the corner? When you can't buy or sell in the last days, do you really think that we're going to have marquee out front here? When there's a death decree for people who stand for the teachings of God? How do we survive as we near the shore? We're going to be gathering in little groups clinging to what's left of the ship as we're carried by the various waves. But up till then, we got to stay as a church together. Cling together. Now, I think it's amazing. They all escaped. Why did they all escape? They were going to kill the prisoners. But because of Paul, they all lived. Because of Paul's prayers, they all lived. And because of the life of Paul, all the prisoners are saved. Paul is like a type of Jesus here. One more, I've got a couple moments left. One more quick story. Now when they escaped, they found out the island where they landed was called Melita. That's Malta today, same island. And the natives, I think your King James says the barbarians, and Luke is writing this, these are primitive pagan people, showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire. They made us all welcome. You know, on some coasts of the world, when ships would shipwreck, the natives would come out, and they'd kill the sailors, and they'd take all the cargo that washed ashore. But instead, these folks are caring more about the souls. But they're pagans. What's wrong with them? You notice, even in the story of Jonah, the sailors did not want to sacrifice Jonah. They were just people. I have been just totally amazed Looking at this uh, tsunami and earthquake in Japan, the devastation there, in some countries that I won't name, you would have had looting in the cities and bedlam and chaos and long lines for food. You had people fighting in the lines. You would have had pandemonium. 
and riots. You know, Japan does not claim to be a Christian country. The vast majority of them statistically are atheists. But the dignity and the self-composure and the kindness that those people are showing to each other through this tragedy, I think it's unsurpassed in history. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. You know, the Spirit of God works on people all over the world. And uh, these people in Malta were people of dignity, unusual kindness. And it's raining, and they built a fire. They saw all these stragglers washing up on the shore, and they're shivering and cold and hungry and gaunt. And, and in the midst of all this, what does Paul do? What a servant. Paul goes out, and he's gathering wood and sticks to put on the fire. Instead of saying, look, you've all been saved because of me, Paul, he was a tent maker. He knew how to work with his hands. He was happy serving. And in the process of gathering the sticks, you know, Paul had a thorn in his side. Many believe it was bad eyesight. He gathered one stick that wasn't a stick. There was a viper. Probably it was a little bit dormant, but as he set this pile of sticks by the fire to toss them in one by one, the thing warmed up. And it came out and it latched on to Paul and it bit him on the hand. It fastened on his hand. Where were Jesus' scars? So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, Ooh, talk about a Greek tragedy. No, they didn't say that. They said, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet because he's so guilty, justice, the very, they believed in justice. They believed murderers should die. They had some good beliefs. They thought, Wow, if this happens to him, he must have some real blood on his hands. We'll not allow him to live. So their first verdict is, Paul is an evil man. He's got blood on his hands. But Paul, totally unmoved by this. By the way, I've got to stop right here. Time's up. No. <laughs> Mark chapter 16, Jesus said one of the signs the disciples would perform, it says, you will take up serpents. That does not mean you're supposed to go to Kentucky and join a church that picks up rattlesnakes. <laughs> Sorry for our Kentucky viewers, but that's where they used to be. You've heard of that, these snake handlers? They read that verse and they say, we're supposed to go find snakes and then reach out and grab them, pick them up and say, I've got the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Like Moses took up the serpent, you know? That's not what it's talking about. It's Paul took up a serpent when it latched onto him. It was, Jesus was prophesying what would happen where they were bit by serpents. Or someone planted one in a basket like the story of Cleopatra. But it wouldn't hurt them. Or poison wouldn't hurt them. And they saw this snake bit Paul. And did Paul get all scared? He said, no, God told me I'm going to Rome. Looks like I'm going to need a Band-Aid. <laughs> and even though this, this is a serpent, it's a pit serpent. It's got the venom glands. It's got the snake eyes, not the round eyes. It latches on. It injects him with venom. They all see him. It's hanging from his hand. It made contact. He shakes it off into the fire. What does a serpent represent? It's the devil. And Paul goes around and continues ministering to everybody totally unfazed. And they knew. He didn't even get a tourniquet. They knew he should have swollen up and gone into a fever and a coma and stopped breathing and died. They knew the serpents on their island. And nothing happened. And how do they end up they changed their minds and they said he's a god. You know, isn't that really what the pagan world said about Jesus when they saw him hanging on the cross and they saw him bearing the wrath of the Father? He poured out his blood, his innocent blood for us and he took the guilt and the blood of all the world on himself. And he took our guilt, he looked guilty he looked like he was cursed when the sky grew dark by God. And there was a storm that day. But then when he said it is finished, and uh, that Roman soldier there at the cross said, truly this was the Son of God. He changed his mind. And when he rose from the dead, those soldiers guarding the tomb, what did they think? They went into the city and said, this is the Son of God, and they tried to pay him. Don't say that. Paul here is really acting out the great controversy. The serpent ends up in the fire. Paul is unharmed. Where is the devil going in the end? 
says that serpent, Revelation chapter 20, an angel takes hold of him. Actually, it's, actually, it's later on. He's cast into the lake of fire. And uh, he's destroyed there. But Jesus is going to be glorified. He's going to be exalted. There'll be no harm done to him. Now, as a result of Paul going to the speck of an island called Malta, he ends up not only impressing the sailors, the prisoners, the soldiers, the natives, he ends up healing the chieftain on the island, and then everyone's bringing all the sick on the island of Malta to Paul. The very bay where they landed is today called St. Paul's Bay, if you go to Malta. It uh, factored heavily in World War II. And um, whole island is converted. What a coincidence that in that storm in the Mediterranean, that after all that being washed to and fro, that that ship should end up on that island. Was that a coincidence? Or did God design that to save those people? He brought them the message. You know, I think this is a wonderful story about how to survive a storm. For one thing, we need to feed on God's Word, right? Amen. We need to jettison from our lives everything that's weighing us down and keeping us from floating. And we need to put our trust in God. Hang on to whatever we can hang on to as the waves beat us ashore. Do you have an anchor in your life? Amen. Are you anchored in Christ? Is your faith fixed on Him? You know, I think we're going to sing as our closing song, Will Your Anchor Hold? How many of you remember that song? We don't sing it much anymore. It's, what is it, 534? 534. Five, three, Why don't you take your hymnals? Let's stand and sing that together as we close. I don't know if you read about it, friends, but uh, I read that the world's going to end. And I read that Jesus is coming soon. It wasn't in the paper. It's in the Bible. I guess even the papers are starting to carry it now. And we have a big work to do. We want to make sure that our anchors are deeply secured to that rock under the water. So no matter what's happening on the top our souls are not tossed to and fro like a ship without a rudder or a sail, but we're anchored in what we believe. We're rooted in Christ. Are you? Have you made that decision? You know, I want to give you an opportunity. If there are some here that uh, realize they've been sort of drifting, maybe you've been going through a storm and you just want to cast your confidence completely on the rock of ages. As we sing verse 5, 
you'd like special prayer, just make your way to the front quickly and we'll pray for you in a special way. Let's sing verse 5 as we close. up we lived a lot by the water growing up and sometimes we'd go out diving snorkeling and uh, when you leave your boat and go out snorkeling everyone wanted to go you want to make sure it's there when you come back and so we'd drop the anchor we'd actually dive down in the water and we would hand fix the anchor into a rock or you're not supposed to do that now a piece of coral or something to make sure that it would be there when we came back have you anchored yourself? Do you know that your life is fixed upon Christ, your eyes set upon Him? Do you know that Jesus, like Paul, took the venom of the devil in His hands on the cross for you and that He is pleading in your behalf? Father in heaven, Lord, what a privilege to be in this place of worship on your Sabbath day, to be gathered with your people. We know uh, that this is a haven right now as the breakers of the world just swirl around us, that there's a hurricane of unrest in the world right now and that we are nearing that time when Michael will stand up and there'll be a time of trouble. There'll be a storm such as there never has been. I pray that your people will find revival in your church that will nourish our souls. I pray, Lord, that we will be committed to staying in your church as your people as we near the shore. We know that the time may come where things break apart and we're just going to have to cling to whatever debris is left. But now, Lord, we especially need to fix our eyes on you and to uh, feast, feast our souls on your word that we might be nourished for the challenge ahead. Bless each person that they might have that experience. We pray for a special blessing on those who have come forward this morning Whatever the needs are in their lives, work a miracle on their behalf and be very real to them. Give them peace. Encourage their souls, even as Paul did the sailors. We thank you and ask this in Christ's name.